to you, please? Anybody that's got a chair empty next to you, please raise a hand. We've got a lot of people standing in the back. If some of you would like to come down and get comfortable, please feel free. We thank you, first of all, for showing up at our panel this afternoon. This is a music interest session. My name is Jerry Schatzer, and I'm from Los Angeles. And uh, I'll be moderating the panel. With me are Wade Driver and Jack Berg. And we are going to have a little discussion time. Each one of us has some things that we want to say. We will later entertain comments from the floor. I think our man is going to set us up a floor mic here, and if that happens, this session is being taped, and we would like to remind all of you that if you have a question or a comment for the benefit of everybody that will be buying the tapes, we wish you would come to the floor mic. Don't wait to be recognized. Just walk up, get up and walk over and take the floor mic. I guess we're going to put it down here on the floor somewhere, Steve, huh? And... Uh, uh, don't wait to be recognized. Walk up and grab the floor mic and ask your question, whatever, <laughs> whatever, and it will save us time, and it will also get your question or comment on the tape that people will be buying. So please adhere to that for the rest of the afternoon. I'm going to ask uh, Jack to start us off this afternoon. He has some opening remarks that he would like to make, and I've asked each one of the guys to give a little background uh, about what they have done and what they are currently do doing in music. All three of us are musicians, and w we are not here this afternoon to give you so much a of a technical discussion of what music is. We figure that you probably have all heard about timing and rhythm and tempo and, and all that good stuff in your caller schools. We're here this afternoon to give you our ideas on how to use music more than what music is technically. Uh, I'm going to get us all three off the hook, I hope. Uh, yes? A little more? A little more voice. How's that? Uh, I take all three of us off the hook here this afternoon and say that, that music is a, to me is a, I'm going to take myself right off the hook right now. Music to me is a very, very subjective thing. And a lot of the comments that we are going to be making here this afternoon, not all three of us may agree with. Uh, you may not agree with everything that you hear this afternoon here. These are things by their very nature that are subjective. They are things that work for us. And we are trying to give them to you to let you know little things that we do as musicians, as trained musicians, things that we carry over into our calling careers. So, uh, if we, and we're going to use some music demonstration here uh, also to take us off the hook. The criticisms or the, the uh, compliments that we hand out to the various labels or, or music that we use here are not really... It shouldn't be taken as criticisms of the label or, or anything more than what they are. They are used for demonstration purposes to point out things. We may point out something that we feel is a weak point. We may point out something that is a strong point. But we wish that none of you would take these as criticisms or, or compliments or endorsements of any label or any music that we're using here. There's simply that, what, uh, exactly what I said. They're simply examples. Okay? So with that introduction, I'll ask Jack to start us off here. Jack Berg from Chicago. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Uh, I am from Chicago, deep in the heart of. I want to welcome you all to uh, Chicago country. I was not supposed to say my labels. I was just welcoming them, okay? Uh, I do want to welcome. We got the best weather that we can possibly get for you. I hope you enjoy it, okay? Uh, I want to ask you all a question to start out with. How many of you, when you teach your new dancers, you teach them to dance to the beat of the music and music as a whole. How many of you? And are you really sure of that's what you're dancing to? Well, I, like Jerry said, I'm not going to get technical on you. Um, I'm going to tell you the different rhythms that we do have. I'm going to explain them the simplest way. My background, by the way, is 30 years as a musician. I'm a drummer. I started out as a jazz drummer, a little classical. Then I stepped up to country. Uh, I thought I'd try a little bit of that and see where that got me. Never thought I'd be into the producing end of Square Dance Records, but I'm certainly glad it did happen. I produce Chicago Country. We have a new one now called CC and, and Around Dance Label. I uh, looked up the word beat, just for the heck of it, in Webster's Dictionary, to get a, a feel of it. Interesting definitions. One was to walk on, of course, in our case, to shuffle on. The second one was to sound or express by drum. I like that one. The third one said to strike repeatedly in, in order to produce music or a signal for direction. 
Uh, that is a super one. I like that one. There is a fourth one, but I, I think we've seen dancers do this. This is not really a good definition. It's kind of negative side. And it said to flap or trash at vigorously. <laughs> I have... Uh, I have gone through a right and left grand having everything grabbed on me, you know, and it wasn't even to the beat of the music, but I, I would hope that, and I'm going to get to the, the beat, I, I've got to tell you, if dancers, if you knew dancers, dancers dance to the beat of the music and all different rhythms that we have, if they take a step to it, you're going to find the timing of your dancers to be right on, your timing, your pacing will be good, you'll be able to pace the better... The, the floor better and you'll enjoy uh, the dancers will enjoy the music more if they know what they're stepping on okay not just taking flopping around vigorously as it says I gotta tell you a quick story where I learned how important the beat was my first professional job was at 16 almost 17 I played in a strip establishment better known as a strip joint that was my first big time job when I got there with my drums I was set up in the corner down in the corner of the stage looking up where the dancers were uh, sure does bring back fond memories but anyway the piano player came up to me and he had to be 147 years old at least that and he said son he says when the dancers come out the beat you're going to play is boom chick boom chick boom chick the second musician came up to me there was only three of us he looked like the older brother and he says, and you're going to play chick boom boom chick boom boom chick boom boom Here I've been studying for four years, and I get two technical terms. Boom chick, boom chick, and chick boom boom I want you to remember those technical terms, because I am going to use it to describe some of the music. And by the way, the chick boom boom did, the beat really did produce some unusual effects to the dancers. Uh, that's another fond memory. And it will... <laughs> It will with your dancers. It will with your dancers. We are so wound up in that about teaching styling, and that's great. Styling means the hands and how to move and how pretty we look. We don't pay too much attention to the feet and the mind, which is part of the beat. Um, I'm going to go very quickly through the beats we all know. I'm going to use terms that are not necessarily correct. What I mean by that is my music is all written in 4-4 four, four time, and the only reason for that is so we don't have to put a lot of notes in one measure, because I understand guitar players can't read a lot of notes. But us drummers can, you see. <laughs> I got a feeling I'm in trouble <laughs> shortly. But let's just say, let's take two, four time. I have, I have um, something down here for all you to take. And it, it has a list of different songs with different feels, different rhythms. And again, as Jerry said, these are only examples of different rhythms, beats, if you please. Feelings is the same thing as beats. And um, I don't recommend them. Yeah, but please come in. If there is still any more uh, any uh, chairs left, please raise your hands. Uh, boom, ch boom, boom. See if that helps. Boom, ch boom, boom. Come on. <laughs> Move in. Well, give me drums. I'll get them in here. Come on in. Come on away up. We're not going to ask questions of the front row. It's the second and third row we ask questions. Okay. All right. The first, and we have two up front here. Come on up. We have two up front. That is Wade Driver. Don't let the beard fool you. You can come on up. Okay? All the way up. I think that's just about takes the chairs right there. Uh, you got one down here. Okay? Um, the first, probably the most common tempo that we use, is the 2-4 cut time. Um, here goes that technical term I told you about. Boom chick. We have a fast 2-4 and we have a slow 2-4 that we've been using. And I'm sorry to say that the records I was supposed to bring down here were demonstrations. I left back home. I, uh, my head wasn't together after I left here last night. But I did pick some records and please, they're only... Um, we'll let you do it, okay? We know what 2-4 is. The fast 2-4 is the boom chick, boom chick. And about 80% of our music now is written in that term. If you put it toward the middle where you see the dark grooves, that'll be a good example. Couldn't ask for anything better. You should see the strippers dance to that. But anyway, you can take it off. We know that when the dancers come in, this is what I do to set up. When the dancers come in, I have music like that playing. I try to stay away from too much melody line. 
Uh, fiddles, I love fiddles, don't get me wrong. But I try to keep it as simple and hard to for as I can get like that. I put that on as they're coming in. I don't care how you get the dancers up. That's the way your technique of doing it. I get them up, and I want them not only to hear the beat, I want them to feel it inside. you got to feel the beat. And the only way that I know of, and it works, is I take the treble off and put the bass all the way up in the beginning. And believe me, it goes right through to your heart. And they'll feel it. Now, you got to tell those people to take a step on each one of those. And that comes in three segments on a fast two-four. Very simple. The bass, the boom... You put your feet down. That's the marching. You got them moving. The chick is the gentle shove in the backside to move them. Well, now they're moving. You're there for one thing. You give them direction. That's the third part. You got them moving. I'll do this for a while, and I'll keep with the fast 2-4. Okay? What I'm getting to is there are other rhythms available, and I think somewhere along the line we should introduce other rhythms. Do not be afraid of it. I have many listed. I want you to now hear... A slow 2-4, or it's still a boom chick, but it's slow. Now, after you've taught them to take a step on each of the bass beats, and you've shoved them along with the, the upbeat or the drum beat, you now introduce something new. Uh, isn't it amazing it's all the same label, Jerry? Did you notice that? Let's uh, put this... <laughs> I could have grabbed one of them over here. on again with the bass up. You don't have to keep this going through all your lessons. You now tell them to step on each beat, boom and the chip. The timing is the same with anything else. Let them hear it. Let them enjoy it. They promenade to the music. Now we don't have boom chicks in hoedowns. Obviously it's just not going to work. The slow one. So you get yourself a singing call like this and let them, let them feel it. Let them promenade up to the middle and back like a pattern. And then introduce singing calls like that. Let them hear the second time. And most of the stuff that I know of, take it off now, Jerry, thank you. Most of the stuff I know, I'm told the comfort range for timing is somewhere around 128 to 130 be 31 beats per minute. I wouldn't go that, or uh, beats per minute. I wouldn't go that fast. 128, 129 is fine. You go any slower than that, you're never going to, never going to learn how to dance when you get them up higher. That is the second type of rhythm. Introduce that to them. Let them feel that. Again, I like the idea of taking the treble, taking it off, taking the bass and them feel it. Somewhere along the line, when you do your lessons, by the way, I would, of course, go back to your normal settings, whatever you may have. Now we get to the fourth one, I think is a very popular one. I think thanks to, and again, uh, I mean this sincerely, rhythm has introduced us to a lot of different beats, especially the rock and roll, the hard four. I like to call it 4-4, four, four, the hard four. Or we call, in the business I was introduced, as the trash can beat. That was rock and roll. Now, you rock and roll people had funny names. He's writing it down. That's another one I want to catch. Rock and roll, trash can beat is a legitimate beat. It's 4-4, four, four, hard 4. Uh, it could be jazz. It could be swing. It could be ragtime. It's a, it's a hard 4 feel. Um, this is definitely a hard 4 put this one on. Now, hard four, there's a bass beat of one, two, three, four. The trash can part of it is the upbeat, the drum, is on two, four. Again, you're going to take the bass all the way up, treble down, let them feel this one. Let them move with it. There's no question that they're going to move with this kind of music, okay? When I say hard four, the emphasis is really on one, two, three, four, and a little less on the two and four. Now, there are some that are a lot stronger on two and four. I had a good example. You can take that off now. Thank you. I had a good example of that. It's called, and again, please, I'm not recommending these records. It's the one that I happen to like, is Redneck in a Rock and Roll Bar. Also on that one is a real good mix. Another thing that you have to do with dancers, let them feel two different beats in the same song. That song, along with um, K-Lox, has one with change of, of tempo, which is, goes from a slow 2-4 to a fast 2-4. The one I just mentioned, Redneck in a Rock and Roll Bar, goes from a 2-4, from a rock feeling, to a fast 2-4.
Nice change. Again, let your dancers feel that. They, by now, you've got them doing hard four, you've got them doing slow two four, and now let them feel something, a change of tempo. The reason I'm getting to all this, really, is the fact that I have gone a couple of dances and put on some records, and new, new ones, slow ones, and watched them fumble about, trying to figure out where to put their feet. And when asked if they ever dance the music like this, they say, well, no, we always get all that fast stuff. I like that fast stuff. Well, that's okay, but you've got to have change of pace music. They've got to realize it. A lot of us callers like different kinds of music. We're being unfair to the dancers when we only let them hear one kind. We've got to let them hear all kinds. There are other kinds. There I uh, went through many of my records. Um, the change of pace was one, and then I, I found something unusual, and I really wish I had this one here. I don't know if you know it, there is a waltz, a square dance waltz. I believe I've got it listed here. Um, I think it's Prairie. <laughs> I, I don't recommend it, but it is unusual that it is a waltz and you take a step with every beat. Boom, you know, it's chick, boom, boom, chick, boom, boom. I tried it one night and watched the dancers step on everything but the beat. It would certainly be a good training record just to see if you've got your dancers by the end of this end, end of your lessons to see if they can really handle something like that. But that is one. In the 4-4 area, there is Latins. We have true Latins and some with just Latin feelings. I've said feelings a couple of times, and I'm, maybe I should explain what feelings mean. We can start out all our basic rhythms at 4-4, 2-4, I don't care what. But it's what you do with the rest of the, inst the instruments and any other kind of percussion that you may have to produce that feeling. Latins, for instance. Um, there are three that are true Latins, meaning that the bass pattern is only on two, three, and four. Okay? They are U Jamaica, and DNR, Chaparral, Sunny is a, a good one, a good example, and Prairie has one out, Lovers Live Longer. These are true Latin beats. They only go on two, three, and four. Interesting. It has a 4-4 four, four feel. The feeling in that, they have other instruments doing things. The guitar is doing uh, things. Thank you. Here's Sonny. Listen to the feeling on this. Nice. It's a Latin feeling, what I would call a true Latin feeling. Now, they don't know where to put their feet. You have to tell them by this time. But this is a true Latin feeling. Okay. Okay. Now, again, there are jazz, there are swing feelings, and there are a lot. I've listed those down also. Um, I'm really covered about all I can on the different rhythms. Uh, there might be other ones, and I really probably missed a lot. I would not be afraid to try different rhythms, but not till further on with your dancers. Like I said, I feel the beat is very important. I think if you give your dancers good variety, you're going to have good dancers. And you may not go along with this next statement, but I believe it very much, that people do not come to dance to you, or me, or to Wade Driver. They pay at the door to see these people, but they come to dance to the music. You merely give them direction, is all you're doing. And if you don't train them, if you don't let them hear different music and really make something out of it, we're all, we're all going to be in trouble because styling isn't going to help. None of that. They've got to learn where to step and keep going. The best example of not following the beat all the way through is watch people circulate. Straight on figures. They always walk. But the minute you do a cast off three quarters, you do a spin the top, suddenly they don't walk on the beat no more. They take the big step to get there right away. You've got to emphasize that. When they are dancing, and they're walking is one thing to step on everyone, but to do any of the cast off three quarters... Spin the tops, anything like that, they've got to take a step to the beat each time. Well, that's about all I've got to say, gang. If you have any questions, I'd be here to answer them. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jack. Anybody have a question from the floor about anything that Jack said? Why don't you all stand up and stretch? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What was the name of that first hold on? Uh, the first hold down is um, Chicago Lily, huh? Yeah, Lily. Chicago. Lily, okay. Did you leave out six eight? Six eight.
Okay, guys, if you want to settle back in, next like we'd like to introduce Wade Driver, of course from Houston, Texas. And we'll ask Wade to tell us a little bit about his background in music, where he's coming from. I think we all know where he is now. And uh, without further ado, would you please welcome Mr. Wade Driver. Thank you, Jerry. Um, <laughs> my background is a little bit different from uh, considering the type of music that we're involved in. Uh, I never heard a, uh, or never paid any attention to a country and western station until nine and a half years ago when I moved to Houston, and only then because there wasn't anything else on the radio <laughs> in Houston. I moved to Texas from Florida. And uh, primarily East Coast most of my life. And uh, in my opinion at that time, if it was not some sort of rock music, uh, I didn't care for it at all. And most of those, uh, unless it was played by a black band, I really didn't get off to it very much anyway. I, uh, from the from the time I was in college and, and while I was in college and after I got out of college, I was a rock singer, rock, rock and roll singer they called it then. And uh, that's where I spent most of my my time was singing with different bands. Primarily worked with with black bands, and I emphasize that because they had a an uncanny way. The bands I worked with had an uncanny way of making rhythm that uh, now it seems to be universal. But that type of rhythm, that 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 very very good rhythm at that time was not considered fashionable. Okay, everywhere. And I know when I was Growing up, I had to turn off my radio at night because I wasn't supposed to listen to that kind of music. And, of course, now nowadays, everyone's into rhythm and rhythmic-type music. And uh, what I'd like to do today is is go over uh, nothing technical, really, but how to use the music that's available to you. It's improved so vastly since... Uh, well, since I first got involved in it, as far as square dancing in, in 1975, when we started Rhythm Records. Uh, and I still, I see a, an improvement in the manner in which callers in general, or some callers, are utilizing the music available to them. But I think that most of us are, or a great deal of us, are passing up uh, the use of, of one of the best tools we've got on the floor. Uh, but like Dick Jones told me a long time ago, he said 90% of your music is much prettier than your voice, which is true, regardless how well you sing. It's hard to match that, that instrumental feeling. and uh, But we rarely shut up and listen to it. You know, most of the time we're so busy talking. Anyway, so what I'd like to go through is is go over a little bit of of how we make our music, by, by our basic philosophy behind uh Recording. It, this is, like I said, just myself. I can't speak of any other labels, but I know some of them think the same way. I want to go over how we, our philosophy in making the music, and maybe you'll understand what we're trying to make available to you, and then perhaps be able to use it. Now, before I go through playing through any records, I want to show you how we do this first, and then I'm going to go into the records. Well, this thing, how, how long is this? Thank you. Uh, this is really no big trade secrets. Some of the labels do this. Some of the labels don't do this. Maybe I can draw backwards. But when I sit down to have a recording session, I, uh, I don't run a really a sophisticated arrangement. We try to uh, uh, pick a key that the, that the song can be done in. And, uh, but in square dancing, we have... We have seven times through the record. That's your opener. Number four is your break. And number seven is your closer. And then you've got your first and second, a first head figure, second head figure, first side figure, second side figure, if you follow a normal progression. Okay? Now, I make, I, I, I don't know, I don't think they're strange lead sheets. My pickers thought they were when we first started this nine years ago. But, I use, That says lead fills. Okay? I use eight musicians as a rule for a stand, standard band, sometimes nine if we have harmonica and banjo both. 
But basically, we use a drummer. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. I have a son who's a drummer too, so I'm kind of. I wish I could do. We use drummer, bass man, uh, bass guitar. That is, uh, rhythm guitar. We use a uh, keyboard, and I emphasize keyboard. I'll get back to it in a minute because that doesn't necessarily mean piano. All right, drum, bass, rhythm guitar, keyboard, uh, steel, lead guitar, fiddle, and for each session, an and or. Uh, banjo and or harmonica my harmonica player has finally decided he wasn't making enough money laying brick and he's moved back and playing again so right now we're back into playing harmonica okay and well he, he took a five year sabbatical to, to some place in Louisiana and decided he wouldn't lay brick and all musicians were crazy and he, wanted, he didn't want to have anything to do with them and I also have a banjo player alright so we have those basic musicians available to us and then Branching off that, off a keyboard, we can use an acoustic piano, standard standard. We can use an upright piano if we want a rinky tink ballroom type of a feel. We can use an electric piano, a basic electric piano. That's all it does, it plays electric piano. Or we can use the Polymoog, which is a synthesizer. It makes it sound like anything you want it to sound like, pretty much. It can talk to you, don't go on here. All right? We've got that combination. All right? Now, in the bass, we have two options. You can play an electric bass. Or you can play an upright old bull fiddle. Okay? Uh, if you happen to happen to have a good upright bass player, it's it's a good sound. All right? If he's not very strong or his has sensitive fingers, do him a favor and don't hire him for a square dance session. It begins to be long at three minutes and forty one seconds of the very same thing over and over. This is what's available. Now, you're gonna have your rhythm section. Right there. Your drum, your bass, your rhythm guitar, and your keyboard player. That's your standard rhythm section. Or we'll use the harmonica to play some upbeats and some, you know, type things. We may come back with a, with a, an electric piano player to play what they call diamonds. A diamond is, you get a note, a chord note at the beginning of each, each phrase. In other words, you might go da da da, you might go dom, dom, dom. It just puts emphasis on each major chord as you go to it. But I don't consider that part of my quote, rhythm track all right so you set up your rhythm track to use we probably will go through and i'll have this rhythm guitar player play twice all right i'll have him go through and lay it down once come right behind it lay it down again because you need that upbeat all right to dance to regardless of whether it's a patter call a singing call or i don't care what it is if your rhythm is not strong you can have the most beautiful leads in the world just write that sucker off because if you can't dance to it the dancers could care less how pretty it is all right so your rhythm has got to be strong now assuming that's going to be all right we've gotten that down hopefully to a science and we know basically we hope we know what the rhythm is going to be whether it's going to be a latin beat whether it's going to be four four two four that's decided by the nature of the song and i sit down with the drummer and say this is what we're going to do because the bass player for me, anyway, is going to play boom, 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 boom. He may change the notes he plays, but he's going to play on every downbeat, period. And somewhere in that drummer's repertoire, while he's going ticka, 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 ticka all around the world, one of them ticks is going to be on the upbeat. So we go boom, tick, boom, tick, boom, tick. Now we may play all around the world and disguise it and kind of subdue it and kind of hide it, but that boom, chick, boom, chick is going to be there to dance to somewhere in that record. All right, then I'm going to sit down and I'm going to say, okay, this little tune... Uh, let's see. I feel like this little tune ought to has a guitar flavor. All right. So we say, all right, this this song, the main thrust of this tune ought to be a guitar. So that's what it ought to sound like. So one, four, and seven. I want to use a guitar. That's going to be one. That's lead. Lead to me, in the square dance feel, means melody, melody of the tune. All right. Now, lead to a musician means anything but melody. Now, the first three years, the first three years in recording is when you don't eat well because it takes that long to communicate with these turkeys, all right? Now, I never really worried about that. I've dealt with musicians all my life. I love them to death, don't get me wrong, and I really do, and I've gained a healthy respect for them. But country pickers don't talk in the same language as South Georgia rock musicians. I'm telling you, they got a whole language of their own, and it takes a long time, you know? And I'm going, I want... I want this kind of thing. Oh, you want a tic-tac guitar? Okay. 
I thought Tic Tac was a little pill you took to make your breath smell good, but that's, 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 what, that's what they say. So, anyway, a lead, you've got to convince these guys, Melody, play the melody. You are a now a singer right through that guitar, and you must play the melody of the tune. You'd be amazed how many really good musicians, they have never played the melody to anything in their entire life. They just don't understand melody. And it takes a while, and they don't believe you, you see. You tell them, and they say, he doesn't really want melody. And so they're going to play what they want anyway. And it, it, it's, it's just, you know. But once you, once you overcome that hurdle, all right, you pick your lead instruments who are playing melody. And you say, all right, we've got a guitar that's going to play one, four, and seven. That's going to establish the tenor of this whole song, all right? Well, I'm going to come behind that, and I'm going to say, okay. The way I, I kind of run my, try to run my records, as we're going from one, two, oh, and over to seven, we're going to start here, and we'll kind of come down and build up to the middle break and come down and build up to that closer, excitement-wise. Okay? So, this is on the down cycle. This is on the up cycle. This is on the down cycle. That's on the up cycle. I'm not going to put a fiddle right there and an electric guitar, I mean electric piano right there, where it's going to go, zoom, and then the, it's, the contrast is going to be too great. Now, I say I won't. You watch. You'll find 14 records. I've done that way. But the object, what I try, what I try to do is say, okay, this if it's a pretty good... Hot little tune, all right? We're going to come on pretty strong with the guitar to start with. So I want to drop it down a little bit for that first head figure, all right? So maybe, let's say, what all have I got here available to me? Well, let's put the steel right there. We're going to drop it down. We're going to let the steel guitar player. Now, that for my, with my particular steel, man, that's not necessarily a drop down, so I have to go back, whatever. And let's say right here we're going to play the fiddle, okay? So right here we're going to play the steel, and right here we're going to play the fiddle. Now, I've done some tunes where we'll just start going guitar, steel, fiddle, dobro, uh, mandolin, and so on down the line. And that works okay, but I have found, I mean, I'm sure none of you guys have ever gotten lost in the middle of a singing column. I have, okay? And, or maybe you've never bumped your record in the middle of a singing column. And all of a sudden, there it is. You've got, you know, two and a half minutes left to go. But is it two minutes and ten seconds or two minutes and twenty seconds? Is it the first head figure or the second head figure? Where is it? I have found it very, very advantageous to us if we have a basic structure, okay? And if that thing's in the beginning of the record and you hear a fiddle playing, you know it's in that second head figure. And if it's in the, the second, you've already gone through the middle break and you hear steel playing, it's got to be the first side figure, okay? So this is the basic approach we take. Now, we make exceptions here and around. All of these, this is what irritates my musicians a little bit. All of this is total waste. Total write-off. Okay? The dancer never hears this. You're singing right on top of it. It is mere, but your Lord knows if I leave it out, which I did once or twice, you ought to see the hate mail I get. I don't know the melody to that tune. I've got to have it on there so I can hear it. How can you hear it? You're singing it. You're singing right square on top of it. You know, I guess if you put it on and you memorize it first, if we had an eradicator, maybe after you learned it, we could erase it off. But we can't do that. We can do that somewhat, but not much. So, in order to make a record sound as close to an original pop tune as possible, we do what we call fills and or chases, which is what I want to get into. Okay? I ask this question every time I do any kind of a session on music, and new guys who have been to mine before know, but I want an honest answer. How many of you have put on a singing call record, put it on, and played that thing all the way through, all three minutes and 47 seconds of it, and not say one word or sing the one note with it, just listen to it? Well, several of you all been in my clinics for it, but prior to that time, you know, People, we just don't do it. We're so enthralled with our voice, we want to sing with that thing. Well, when you sing with it, you can't hear some of the really nice musical uh, renditions that the musicians are doing that you can use. Okay? And that's what I want to go over. All right? Because I might like come along here and say, all right, we're going to do, I've gotten where I'll do double sets of fills. I'll come along in the middle right here, and I'll say, all right, the harmonica is going to fill all the way down the line. Now, I found that what this does for me, it tightens up, tightens up the whole record with no holes. Because I'll come over here and say, okay, the steel is going to fill the guitar. The guitar is going to fill the, the I'm sorry, the fiddle is going to fill, I won't normally do that, though. I'll normally come electric piano. Electric piano is going to fill the steel, and the uh, guitar is going to fill the fiddle. 
Okay? First time through. And maybe on the middle break, I'm trying to get some excitement. Let's let the fiddle fill the guitar. And on the closer, we'll let the fiddle fill the guitar. And let's see, we got guitar filling the fiddle. And we got electric piano filling the filling the steel. Alright? Now, and the harp's filling them all. What I mean by this is that, okay? When I record, okay, a tune, whether it's going to be my tune or Pat's or Bob's or Jerry's or Kip's or, or Steve's or Mike's or whoever, I get in the little, I call it the outhouse, it's the vocal booth, okay? I get in the little vocal booth and I sing with them and kind of direct while I'm in there. And if I come to an area, you know, you might tell a fiddle player to get off his buns and play the thing and stop sitting there trying to, you know, play Patsy with it. You just kind of talk to them while you're going through. And it gives them an idea of what you want, okay? Once we've got it down pretty good, we'll go through it, you know, for the last time. As I'm singing, I try to sing as straight on the melody as I possibly can. All right? The melody. No more, no less than the melody. And I tell, first of all, I want these guys playing that melody. And then I tell these guys over here, every time you don't hear me, play. All right? Because I don't want no gaps in there. Because if I'm going to say, uh, she's a good hearted woman in love with a good time and man... That's about as dull as you're going to get, you know. I want somebody to play something in that hole, all right? Now, these guys not being perfect, although they think they are, but not being perfect, I tell this man here on the harp, if you don't hear me and you don't hear them, play. <laughs> all right? <laughs> now, <laughs> now you know why my harmonica player went to lay break in Louisiana. <laughs> all right? He lays a lot of my gourd. But anyway... I have found that more and more and more of the music coming out on all the labels are starting to do this. And basically what it accomplishes is this. When you're up there singing that song, when you stop singing, this whole you know, the, the dancers don't hear these melody pick pickers. They don't hear them. They hear you instead of. And then in between, just like on a pop record, when you stop playing, they fill right on in there. Okay. Now, there are some places where the, the producers have put instrumental rides that play through both areas. They play through the melody, and they'll play through chases. It's just nice. It is not necessary, in my opinion, that the dancer spend all of its time listening to our voices. All right? I can say, hit two couple square through four hands, go all the way around, and when you meet the outside pair, get a right and left through. Or I can say, hit square through. Right and left through. If I got something pretty for them to listen to, then that's, you know, why not? A head square through tells them the same thing as a head square through. Go four heads around, all the way around the square. When you get already done, do A. All right? A head square through tells them the same thing. All right? It used to be, at least when my dad first t- taught me to call, it was very fashionable to make everything run. Swing through two by two, and the boys run to the right, you do, and to bend that line to face that suit, and right to left through, and turn you do. And all you, all you lacked was breathing time. You know? But... First of all, the music was not on the par as it is today. Second of all, we had, what was that, 15 figures? I guess that's about all it was. They didn't have to dwell a whole lot of times on picking out which figure you're fixing to call next because you didn't have much of a choice. But now we've got maybe eight or 9,000 things we can throw at them. They don't need all that miscellaneous, <clears throat> can't say that, we'll be on tape, miscellaneous sayings that we throw uh, uh, in the middle of this thing, you know? They don't still need all that stuff. So we try to simplify our oral approach to them. And where you do have dead time, not speaking singing calls, all right? Utilize the music. I'd like to go through a few and give you an idea of some of the things. And a lot of these are going to be tunes that you have used. Uh, the tunes that you have used, and uh, you may or may not have heard of these little points. All right. This first one is the example I was speaking of a while ago, where you just call as little as possible, because it's, it's such a nice, nice, nice piece of music. Uh, this is the thing called "Come to Me" on hi hat, and uh, it's the middle break coming up. All right. Right here. All right. Good. On this little tune, my particular approach is. Uh, it's such a nice guitar that I don't want to say as little as I can, all right? Four ladies chain, chain them home, 
circle left. and wheel. All right. When I, you finish the song, what the dancer will do will come up to you and say, God, you sing so pretty. <laughs> it's a fact. I've had it happen too many times. It's an absolute fact of life, all right? You know, it's pretty. All right, use of various and sundry instruments, all right? Uh, this will give you an idea of what I'm calling up with the chases, the fills, and the so on, okay? And the melody, the, this whole program, okay? time through it'll start a different lead picker but the other picker is going to come in behind and, and play the uh, chases right guitar steel chase guitar steel chase now when the steel comes up as it said over here uh, I want something softer now, see, this is the soft love song. So rather than really build into that thing, I was kind of just laying them down, okay? So we hit the steel part. When we hit the steel part, I want to kind of soften it off because, I, hey, we're fixing to get to the middle break, guys, and we want to sing a love song. And I don't want to be them hanging them from the rafters up here someplace. So when we come to the second side figure coming up now, I want to lay them down a little bit, all right? Steel. Piano. You can use those little bells, and it's so nice, it's so easy, you don't have to say much. Hit a couple's promenade halfway, walk in the square through four. They just, and they make it just sound so pretty, and it, it's doing all the work for you, all right? Now, as you go through, all right, and listen to various and sundry songs. All right, this is uh, a chaparral. You're always on my mind. There's a, a couple of harmonica rides in here that if you don't sit and listen to these records all the way through, you might not notice that thing. On your turntable, you have... These are whatever, hello. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to trip you there. Nor me. You got my umbilical tied there. Here you go. All right. All right. Here we go. Now... If you have, how many are familiar with what a graphic equalizer is? Okay, well, let me, let me, boy, this is going to be the most non technical graphic equalizer you ever seen. Here's the box. The wire comes in the front and the wire goes out the back. Now, now, on this thing here, you've got about, it can vary anywhere from two to I've seen as many as 60 channels. All you're doing is you're taking a spectrum of sound. DBs, all right, in, in frequency ranges. From the bottom, which is down yonder, okay, to way up yonder, all right, and everywhere in between, and you're splitting it into however many equal parts you want to split it into, all right? Obviously, the more channels you have, the more individual control you have over each frequency, all right? But if I'm going along now, I'm sure you've heard about this new device they had, this, the uh, voice eliminator. All right. Well, all they've got is a graphic equalizer, and you find the frequency of the man's voice and pull it out, and his voice goes, Shoop! it's gone. All right. When they master a record, that's all they do. You say, hey, i got too much kick drum. He said, fine, we'll get over here in the kick drum frequency, drop it down 2 dB, and it's down where you wanted it. You can do as much with a graphic equalizer almost as you can with a full 32-channel mix board all right, with the original tracks because you have control. Now, you do have bleed over. <laughs> Like, for instance, say your steel's too hot, so you want to bring it down. Make sure it's not the same frequency range as your female singer because you just lost your voice, too, you know. <laughs> so you've got to make sure where the overlaps are, all right. So this is basically all it is, and you have little levers, and you can up and down. Now, what I started from, this little box we use to call with has a graphic equalizer in it. It's a two-channel graphic equalizer. It's not bass and treble controls. It's a two-channel graphic equalizer. And I see guys say, well, my song's too, too, uh, bassy. I'm gonna add some treble to make it sound better. Well, adding treble till <clears throat> someplace freezes over ain't gonna help that bass. Turn the bass down. 
Okay? Or if you say, I don't have enough kick drum. Uh, no, they'll say, what I hear they say is too tinny. So I'll turn the treble down. All right? Or I'll turn the bass up. That's what to do. Well, it doesn't correct it. All right? Now, on any record... Gimbal, I want to hear that Charlie McCoy here. All right. Now let's... All right. There's a beautiful harmonica on this song. All right. You don't have to call much. And if you use this little equalizer or this treble noise, you can just a little bit to whatever degree you want. You have to practice. All right. But when it comes in, I want to emphasize just that part. All right. It's square through, get me four. No side do the corner one. Swing through. That's all you gotta do. You know, you got another hand, all you gotta do is use it. Alright? You know, <laughs> just get over here and just use the thing. Going up and down. He's got some nice licks on these things. Uh, now, I'm still cooking here. Uh, you can also utilize if you pay any attention to these things, if you sit and listen to them, listen for certain licks and certain things they do, you can l- utilize rhythm changes or special things they do with an effect. Okay. Finally, and I'm sure, sure you all have noticed it, but after many, many years, I got tired of you promenade home and you sing the last line of the song. Then you say swinger, and you sing the rest of the song, and they stand there and look at you like, come on, dummy, finish it. All right? And I will do almost anything. I'll promenade them to the bathroom and back before I'll have them just stand there and look at me while I sing that last song. Okay? So we've taken the size face grand square half and, and uh, chained the, the ladies over and back. This is a brand new tune. Paul Markham does an ESP. That it has an unusual ending. It's dynamite for that, if you'll just listen to it. Okay? It's uh, uh, Merle Haggard. That's the way love goes. And... Well, listen, the ending times, if you can just, you'll have to imagine ladies chaining over, chaining back, and the last courtesy turn being very, very slow. Okay? It's a rhythm change. That's too far. Don't you know I love you too? And that's the way to chain the ladies over and back. just jump all over that. They just eat that thing up. All right? I heard a guy told me, they said, I got that song. And he says, you know, I keep forgetting that's there because I didn't know it was there until I called it three times. <laughs> if you listen, you can do amazing things. Okay? Instrumental tags are not a bad thing. And I don't say that just because I started putting a lot of them on here. All right? But use your instrumental tags if you can. Uh, that is a, a very pretty instrumental tag. You can do a hot one where you may not have time for a chain over and back, but you can alamain left and swing. Okay? Now, the the tune that, that Merle Haggard, that's another Merle Haggard tune, thing called Red Bandana. The biggest part of that whole song he did was his intro and his tag. I mean, even on his song, the middle kind of didn't really tell you a whole lot or anything, you know. Kind of rhythmic, rhythmic and typical Haggard tune, but it had a dynamite guitar uh, uh what we call a guitar stack. He's got three or four guitars in a stack in harmony playing this intro in his tag. All right? We cut this record four years ago, and I wouldn't put it out because couldn't find a guitar figure to play that intro in that tag. Of course, the difference is with Haggard, it was at 80 beats a minute. With us, it's 130. And the guitar picker was having a little problem with, you know, going up and down the line, which I sympathize with a little bit. But we finally pulled it off, okay? So, and it's here, and I was listening to a guy uh, uh, when we were running through the studio, and... Uh, the temptation is to sing along with this and you to do whatever you don't well please. But I found it works better if you on a <laughs> if you don't, you know. Do an alloman left. Whoops, I missed my little beat there. Yeah, you can't change it the way you want to be. Do an alloman left. I don't know who produced this record, but I wish him. All right, he's coming to the end. I can't change it the way you want me to. You do an Alabama left and swear. On 
when you got something that, and there are several that do that, when they go to the trouble to put that kind of a tag on there, use it, because that's what identifies this song. I will guarantee you, hopefully, you know, that anybody who's ever heard this tune or anything, as soon as, come on, they know what that song's going to be. You know what I mean? The intros and tags are one of the most important things you've got in your case, because if a song is popular and they like it, you put that intro, they're, in, they're, they're excited for you have a start. I mean, you're, you know, you've got, you're in, already in the fourth inning with a five run lead, boy, you know, and if you can just hang on to that thing for the rest of the thing, you get it made. Alright? Now, uh, Jack used this to demonstrate a Latin beat a while ago, and I'm on, there's a place in here that is, uh, this particular song, Sonny, that Ken Bauer did on Chaparral, I think it's Dynamite. Uh, I happen to like the song, but the way they did it is so unusual. It's not like the original tune, but it's, it's really quite good. There's one place in here. Now, you know, you can talk to your band. If you ever listen to Merle Haggard perform, he talks to his band, his band members all the time. And when they get ready to play, he'll tell them to play whatever. Now, it may sound kind of dumb, but you can tell, you know who's on here. You know, come on drums, come on guitar, whatever. Talk to them to give the dancer as much of a feel of, of a live show that they're being entertained as you possibly can. Now, I talk to the drummer on this thing, and I don't even know him, you know. I mean, he's for chaparral. But there's one place in here, at the end of the middle break, that's just dynamite. Sonny, oh, so true. Baby, I love you. Hey, I'm drums. Listen to this. And the dancers just go, Whee! and they're ready to go, you know. It's not much. You can say, my goodness, it's two beats. But they'll remember that. It helps you if you just use it. You know, you're never going to find, I wish I could cut a record that just helps you all the way through. I haven't found one of those yet. But uh, <clears throat> there are a little notes, and I'm just going through several of these. This is, is a little tune on Red Boot. Dave Stutter did. And there are little things on here. This is a, a, a kind of a singer's song, and it's a Ronnie Millsap tune, but there's a little guitar chase in here, okay? That's excellent. I don't know where I am. Now I know. He's got the sunshine. Oh, I got the rain. Right there, all right? Don't talk over that thing. It's prettier than you are. You know, I, I, I get paranoid out there. People, you know, and of course, Jerry Hagan and I have a standard joke. He cut a tune a long time ago, and I didn't bring it this time. I normally do. But he's something about your baby I like. And on the, I think it's the first side figure, I think it is, first, second side figure, there is a gut string guitar run in there that just knocks me out. And he had his sides promenade half and down the middle and square through, and they get four hands, and you can't hear it. You know, but fortunately on the instrumental side you could. And of course, again, I've been joking about it for a long time. But when you've got something like that, my goodness, let that thing play. Now there are occasions, there are some instruments that you can just rear back and let go because they're gonna cut right through you, your voice, everything else. They're gonna be heard. Okay, fiddle's one, mandolin's another one. All right, we got a got a middle break on this tune here. It's brand new, and Kip just did. And he says, don't you think that mantle might be a little hot? I said, I done tuned it down. It's almost gone. It won't go away. No matter what you do, it's going to come through. Now, uh, I'll show you what I mean. This is the middle break. There's one place in here you can just rear back and let it go. No matter what you do, he will be heard. Now, 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 now you laugh, but I'm serious. Unless you just turn him down, he's going to get through. Swing that lady around and promenade on home. Oh, what a setup. Holy cow, Delta. I can't outdo him. He will come through. Okay? So when you got one like that, it's a sound that doesn't knock you dead. Shoot, go ahead and use it. Because it really is great. One of the toughest things we get is trying to find a chase instrument that can, or a lead instrument, that can play at the same time that you sing. All right, and you can be heard with clarity, and it can also be heard and or felt back there. Okay, that happens to be one of the times you never know when you're going to bring it off and when you're not. All right, one more little doodad. Now I'll get out of here. A couple, two more. Use of again, use of your equalizer. His little tune called "Down on the Corner." 
on Red Boot. All right. It's original. Well, I think Jerry Reed did it most recently, but originally a Creedence Clearwater Revival tune, which put it in my era, which I happen to like. All right. And there's a middle break on here that's just, <clears throat> I love it. And uh, you can use, there's a, there's a, a bass guitar. And here it goes, dom, 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 okay? That's all it does. And that's basically all it is. And you're singing the little, the words in here, which is, <laughs> i got to recite this. Well, Rooster hits a washboard. And people, they got to smile. And Blinky pumps a good bass and solos for a while. I'm not going to go through the rest of it. It's kind of cute, but it, it, it's, it's really kind of a nonsensical tune. Unless you've been down on New Orleans on Bourbon Street on the corner and watch the kids come out and do their thing for money. But, uh, the object of this whole tune is rhythm, rhythm, rhythm. It's got unusual rhythms. And this is just the opener part. Now, I'll show you the difference between it and the break. I'm talking about it. Now, he's, now Don's got his laid back. Again, he's playing the melody so that you can hear it while you sing. But basically, you just got a rhythm to sing the first part to. And then he's going to bring it in to support you when you come back with the Alaman left. Alaman and weed. Now he's got your 2-4 rhythm going for you, all right? And then what's really nice, if you want to do maybe a little complex or something neat choreography on the first part of the figure, you can do it because it lays it back for you. Then you can really jump on it, all right? Say, for example, you want to work a tricky little lead-in into an 8-chain 4, which is going to be a breeze, okay? So you can do that. This is the figure right here. So you can just talk to them, call whatever you want, group the upside down, wide do, beep, beep, whatever you want to do, and around one and in between seven, around the other side right here, and then do a do side do one time around, do an eight chain four. And then get an ass up on the song, okay? Now, which is a big help. Now in the middle break, listen to the difference the way it is to the way it can be. Call man. This is a middle break. Come on, man. Now you just sing it. Now let's do a little tag. Right. That's the little thing a dancer remember. However, I'm thinking to myself, so I would sure like to pump that bottom end up and just have it hammer, okay? And if Don really makes this thing right. I can run that bottom end up, and I won't lose the top end because he and I both know that the top half of this equalizer is not affected by the bottom half of this equalizer. And that treble should still stay there even though I'm cranking. All right, so. This is the break. Out in the street, really in the... Now listen. And I've got bass full go picked all the way over, but it does not affect that treble. It's still there, okay? So you can use this thing and play with it. If the record is mixed properly, which this one is, you can just do whatever you want to with either half because one has nothing to do with the other. You know, spanking your daughter or your son has nothing to do with spoiling your daughter. One and the other doesn't affect the other, all right? Uh, one other little thing here. This is a, a, what I was talking about of, of running three parts. That is a, a melody, a fill, and a one constant chase. All right, on this particular record, uh, which is a new one we just did, I did just that. We had a lead on every time through, a fill on every time through, a chase on every time through, and then a harmonica filling all the way through. You can't always hear it because he just he didn't come in like on a regular basis. He came in where the holes were. Okay, so you'll see what I mean. I hope. This is the redo. We just did it in an old wagon wheel tune. Guitar. Fiddle. Now, right now, there's no place to go, so he's what we call chugging. Chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. Right here. That heart chugging. Now, I gotta tell you the truth, I don't know where they all are either that much at this point just yet. But I'll give you an idea what we're talking about. Now, what you want to listen for is holes. Hopefully we don't have any. Middle 
break, the piano is not as versatile as these other lick or as filling holes. If it does, it gets busy. So the harmonica had a lot of time to jump in there. Come on, man. A harmonica player is an amazing animal, all right? He has absolutely, he's like a cheetah. He has instant reflexes. He's just waiting for somebody to leave me a crack. I'm going I'm to jump in there, boy, you know? Uh. That's basically it. I'm trying to avoid being... Uh, unplug it. I'm trying to avoid being technical. I'm just telling you what we do and how we do it. And if you look for that, I think you'll find things in music and in records that you can use and make your presentation better, make you more popular, I hope. All right. Thank you. Everybody stand up and stretch. Settle in and we'll get finished here. That, to me, is one of the most beautiful presentations I think I've ever seen on how to use music. Um, I have to, I'm going to be real honest and, and tell you that I was going to do the same kind of thing. <laughs> but it's interesting, as a musician, I see a lot of, of those kind of things. I, I truly had it laid out to do that kind of thing. And if we get down to the end, I have some other things that I wanted to say. But if we get down to the end, I'm going to pull out some more. But it's interesting that a record producer is putting those things in for us as callers to look for. I've always felt like they're there. They don't come along that often. And many times you can, if you're looking for that kind of thing, I've always been curious of, of you know, why don't more record producers put those kind of things in. Uh, here you're talking to a man who's a musician and, and knows how to use his music, and he's putting them in there. And uh, I'm... I have to say that, like Wade, I've had callers come up to me or dancers come up to me and say, do you buy special records because we dance that same tune to our caller and it doesn't sound like that. And I've had guys come up to me when I work at a turntable. I, I work right. I always work with my turntable on my left and my hand is always down here. And they think I'm playing with the volume and I'm not. I'm playing with the bass and treble controls for just that reason, to pull out those little things that he's talking about. And there's not too many callers that do that, and I guess I'm kind of an odd bird, but people walk up and say, boy, you sure play a lot with that volume. And I'm not, I'm not playing with the volume. I'm playing with the bass and treble to bring out that graphic equalizer. I've never heard it referred to that way, but that's what it is. Uh, guys, it's there. All you have to do is sit down and listen, not only to your singing calls, by the way, but to your hoedowns also. Hoedowns are constructed the same way. A caller once said to me, know your hoedown as well as you know your singing call, because you can capitalize on some good passages in a hoedown, too, if you want to create excitement. Every time you set the needle back, if you know where the excitement is on that hoedown or where the quiet passage is on that hoedown, you can adjust your music to suit your choreography by setting the needle back. It's all there. Beautiful, beautiful. Some of the stuff that I'm going to say now probably should have been said at the first, but I'd like to, to leave you with some thoughts here as we complete the hour. Uh, as a caller, as far as the psychology of music, you ask why are we interested in how to use music? And the reason that we're interested in how to use music is for crowd control. 
you can do it. You can control your dancers, control their feeling, control the kind of mood that you put them in, control the kind of time that they have that evening just by using music. As Wade or Jack here said, I'm not sure which, that music is there not only to back you up, it's there to enhance you. Probably the music is prettier than most of our voices. And if you use that music... It can enhance you, it can set you off, uh, it can control your crowd from a mood standpoint, you can make them happy, you can make them uh, sentimental, uh, you can make them sad if you're not careful, you don't want to do that too often. Yes? Well, you can, all right, I understand what you're saying. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'd like to, to talk to you a little bit about uh, how to use your music the first remember the first tip of your evening sets the mood for the whole evening if you come in with a dreamy ballad on the first tip of the evening you've set the mood for that evening as being a dreamy kind of passe evening you don't want to start off with a blockbuster if you do that you've got nowhere to go but down the first time of the evening has to be something kind of middle of the road not too sad not too up and then you build as wade said on your chart over here you build on an up and down curve you never ever maintain for a whole evening you don't even maintain for two tips the same kind of a mood if you've got people high all evening long they're going to go home burned out and if you've got them low all evening long they're going to go home thinking they didn't have a good time you've got to vary the mood of the whole evening you take them up for a while you bring them down for a while you take them back up again you hit the middle of the road every once in a while you never ever try to maintain a mood a lot of guys uh, that i work with or, or uh, have called with they seem to me to always pick those rouser go-getter singing calls every single time the climb the rafter type singing calls because they have done them and they get a tremendous reaction out of them and there's nothing wrong with those but we as callers should realize that too much of a good thing including rouser climb the roof type singing calls are going to drive people right up the walls and they'll never come down they'll go home when their eyes will be this big you want to vary the mood of the evening with your singing calls with your uh, the way you use your music you never ever progress slowly from a high excitement state if you've done something that's that's really a climb the roof type thing you never ever bring the crowd gradually down after that because what they do psychologically is they come down like this they start to wilt so if you've done something where they're climbing the walls the next thing that you come back and do is you do your best uh, what shall I say, 4-4 four, four shuffle type tune, something that is really pretty. And the, thing, the one that pops to mind immediately is El Paso City because I've been looking at Ernie Kinney sitting back there. If you, the contrast will drive the crowd wild. If you bring them from here down to this beautiful type singing call, but you don't bring them down slowly. If you bring them down slowly, they're going to wilt on you. Okay, so you always follow a tremendous high with a beautiful, beautiful low. The contrast is what you're looking for. Uh, I'm going to skip over a little bit of stuff here. I'd like to talk about how a caller uses music in a variety of circumstances, and, and I've mentioned I'm going to mention a couple of different circumstances here. First of all, a one-night session, a one-night stand, or the first night of lessons. You as callers, I don't think, should ever use what I call scream and fiddle music on a one-night stand or a first night of lessons. The reason is people come into a square dance with a preconceived notion about what square dancing is. It's in the barn with bib overhauls and a plaid shirt and high kicking and jumping and screaming. And we want to get away from that old image of square dancing. I'm talking about people who are not square dancers now, one night stand type stuff. And a scream and fiddle promotes that kind of image of square dancing. And I, I'm, I hope you all know what I mean by a scream and fiddle type thing. Up jump the devil comes to immediately to mind. There's nothing wrong with a tune up jump the devil. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece of music. But uh, it's the kind of thing that I lay on to people once their tastes have been refined. Once they don't think that square dancing is screaming fiddles and bib overhauls and jumping and hollering and kicking. You want to pick something that's more modern. Something, Anything that goes along with what we know is the modern image of square dance music. Something that has a piano or a steel lead or a guitar or something like that. Try to stay away from the scream and fiddle image of music when you're dealing with beginners. 
uh, same same thing when dealing with, uh, in your lessons, your first few night of lessons. Gradually, you introduce the more traditional sound of music and square dancing, but try to stay away from it at the very beginning of the lessons until the people are indoctrinated a little bit more. I like to I like to think of what is the music. If I pick a hoedown, I like to think what is the music of that hoedown saying to me? Is it is it allowing my voice to come through? Uh, for instance, if if I pick a, uh, say I'm going to do a workshop, this is a new hoedown on Red Boot called Do. And if I'm going to do a workshop, this is actually Mountain Dew. It's a very subdued Mountain Dew. There's almost no melody there at all. And now when I pick a hoedown, I always have a purpose in mind. If I'm going to do a workshop, I try to keep the music in the background. I don't want the dancers getting involved with the music. I don't want the music saying to the dancers, uh, dance, let's, let's uh, get up and climb the walls. If it does, then it's going to interfere with the workshop. My voice has to come through. If the choreography is going to be complicated, then the music has to stay in the background. And this kind of tune, which is subdued kind of music, will stay in the background. My choreography can get complicated, and the music doesn't interfere with that. On the other hand, if you pick up uh, if you pick up something, this is sunshine on Joe Pat. If you pick up something like this, the music gets a little bit exciting. Or if you pick up any of the scream and fiddle type hoedowns, like up jump the devil or up the creek or something along that order, that music gets real exciting. And to my mind, psychologically, you're frustrating the dancer by giving them complicated choreography with music that says excite, relax, get uh, not relax, but relax your mind, relax your mental state, get excited, and let's dance. So try to match the mood of your music with the mood of what you are doing. Are you dancing or are you workshopping? Are you trying to make them think mentally? Very difficult type stuff. When you're at a festival, one of the biggest, uh, the most common mistakes that I see a lot of callers make uh, when you're at a festival, you're usually working with another caller, or if you're at a convention someplace, you have to follow a caller. And I cringe when I see a caller walk up on a podium with one record in his hand. Sometimes they don't even stay in the hall while the caller that preceded them is calling. How do you know how to follow the guy that came on? You don't know what he did. Did he, did he have him going up the walls, or was it a relaxer? If you walk over from the hotel room with one record, I, you know, I've got to call one tip, or I've got to call a hash and a singing call, and I bring two records, you have no idea what the mood of the crowd will be following the guy that just called. If you're, if you're working with another guy, try to work with him. There are some guys, I'm sure all of you have worked with guys, and, and uh, I don't know what to say other than they may be show stealers. Every time they get up to call, they drive the crowd right up the walls. And I've got a choice. I can keep them up there or I can bring them back down. When you're working with another guy, you have to share the glory of bringing the guys up back up the walls. It's just as glorified to have them down here enjoying something smooth and rhythmic, uh, rhythmical and, and uh, a sing-along type thing. But uh, did you ever work with a guy that every time he got up to call, you knew that the people were going to be right up here on the roof? And you say, oh, God, I've got to bring them back down again. Uh, watch when you're working with another guy. Work with him. Share, share the... Uh, uh, transition uh, the mood changes of the hall when you're picking a singing call uh, I like to think that there are three steps in picking a singing call picking a new record to add to your case is a better way of saying it the first step is the selection of the record actually picking it the second step is the adaptation of it preparing that call preparing that record getting ready to call it and then the third step is the presentation calling it at a dance when you select a call, the first step, selecting the music that you're going to use, you listen to the quality of the music. You listen to what key it's written in. Is it within your vocal range? By the way, I've heard callers say that that record is not in my key. The key does, uh, does not determine whether or not you can sing a, a singing call. The, the, uh, the musical range, the high note, the highest note that it hits and the lowest note that it hits. That's what determines whether you can use a record. And I've watched guys walk in when they put the, uh, some of the labels put keys on the label, and they walk in, they look up, and they, and they see that's in the key of G, and they go, oh, "That's not my key. I sing an E flat." There's no such thing, guys. It's only the range of the tune that determines whether or not you can use it. When you're analyzing a new piece of music, look 
first at the tempo. Does it need it to be speeded up? Does it need it to be slowed down? Look at the instrumentation, all the variations that Wade has just given you. A beautiful, beautiful demonstration. Are there some things in there that you can make use of by boosting the treble or the bass at one point or another? That takes a lot of listening. That really takes a lot of listening, but it pays off so very much at the dance. That's the little things that separate the professional from a guy who's just up there calling along with the music. If you're going to use the choreography on the thing, look at the choreography. Does it use standard basics? Are the body mechanics smooth? Are there any little glitches in the thing? Just because something is on a record, it's not sacred, guys. Anybody can record if they've got enough money in their pocket and are willing to part with that money. They can make a record. There are a lot of callers who think just because it's on a record, it's sacred, and it's sure not. Don't get up and presume that the choreography is good or it's all flowing or that it times out perfectly. Is the choreography boring? Is it goalpost choreography? You know, the heads are always doing everything and the sides are standing around watching them. We don't have that happen too much anymore, but it does happen. To me, that's boring half of the, half of the people in the hall. Listen to the call side. I have, I've heard callers say, I never listen to the call side because then I become a copy of the guy on the other side. There's nothing wrong with, you don't have to copy, but imitation is a sincere form of flattery. Also, imitating somebody who's very good won't hurt you as a caller at all. If you've got somebody on the other side that you respect or who has obviously made a place for himself in this activity, listen to the call side. Not only can you profit by imitating him, but you may see some cute, or you may hear some cute things on the other side that are not on the cue sheet also. I, like, I, I also try to match the mood of the choreography with the mood of the music. Does the music say short, snappy choreography, or does it say long, drawn-out type choreography that, that is smooth-flowing, lots of square-throughs, spin-chain-throughs, and things like that? Or does it say short, snappy moves like curly cues and split-circulates and boys' runs and things like that? Try to match the choreography with the, mu the mood of the music. When you're looking at the figure in the singing call, look at the timing. Is there enough time to execute, execute each movement? Again, nothing is sacred just because it's on a piece of vinyl. Do you have to eliminate a do -si do or put in a forward and back to make the timing work? Well, word inversion. Uh, what do we mean by word inversion? Head square through. When you meet the outside pair, do a swing through. Does it need to be changed? Head square through, swing through with the outside too to make the timing come out right. Now the only way that you can determine that is to call it and watch your dancers at the same time. If they're waiting for that swing through, then obviously you've got to invert the commands and we call it word inversion to make the timing work out. The word metering has to be tied closely with the metering of the music. And this is the most common of mistakes, especially among those of us that hash our singing calls. And I've got two examples. I, I hope that I can get across what I'm talking about here. These I want to put on because uh, I'm going to give you a real bad example, if I can do it. I'm not even sure I can do it myself. But I, I hear this so common when guys are, especially when they're hashing singing calls. This is an old record called Take Me Out to the Ball Game, and I just picked it because it's a tune that I don't know very well. And you all know the tune. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. All right, now I want to try to match my musical square dance commands to the phrase of the original lyrics. So it's going to sound, hopefully, something like this. Cross the ring and go. Chain the ladies back and turn your own. Now that kind of sounds like the word meeting of the original tune, right? All right, compare that with this. Walk around the corner, turn your partner left to do pass so her by the left in the corner, lady by the right hand round to go and turn your partner left. You see what I'm saying? I'm adding a lot more words in the, uh, the square dance commands than were ever there in the lyrics. It doesn't sound like take me out to the ball game at all. That's the first thing. The second thing is you're frustrating your dancers by making them dance to the phrase of the music while the phrase of your lyrics is something totally different from the phrase of the music. 
Does that make sense to everybody? It's a common mistake that we make as callers because a lot of us are starting to hash our singing calls. And I don't think a lot of callers think about word metering matching the music metering, matching the music phrasing, not metering, but matching the music phrasing. It's something you have to look out, especially if you're a hasher on singing call type things. I'm going to go real quick here. Uh, when you pick a hoedown, how do you pick a hoedown for your use? First of all, as I said already, the key doesn't matter so much. Well, the key matters more on a hoedown. Obviously, it's got to be within your vocal range. But when you go in and listen to a new record, um, a caller who happens to be here for the first time in many, many years, his name is Earl Johnston from Connecticut, said to me several years ago, the first thing you do when you put on a record, you don't think square dancing. You think nonsense syllables. And I go into record shop, and, and I guess there's probably people... I try to get off in the corner and listen <laughs> if I'm in a record shop because I sound pretty silly when I'm listening to a new record. I'm not thinking square dance terms. I'm thinking dum dee dum dee dee dum dee do 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 dee do da dee dum dee dum 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 Just nonsense syllables to tell me or not whether or not I can chant to that thing, whether the music is going to get start interfering with me as a caller. You go from nonsense syllables first, then into just saying square dance terms, not choreography. The next term is just, can I put the square dance words to that music? So let the music play and just start saying square dance terms. It doesn't have to make sense choreography-wise. It doesn't have to flow. It doesn't have to work or anything like that. All you want to know is, can you work the square dance words into that music? And then finally, the third step is, can you put choreography start putting, trying to call to the thing choreography, even if it's very simple, choreography that you know works. So three steps in trying to pick a hoedown. Nonsense syllables, and then square dance words, not necessarily choreography, and then finally, can you put choreography to it? It's a quick way of finding out whether or not a hoedown is useful to you. It takes you about maybe 30 seconds, a full minute at most, and yeah, I, I have found that I have eliminated buying a lot of extra hoedowns that way. I've bought several, I get them home, and I just can't use them for one reason or another. Maybe they're strongly phrased. Maybe they have a melody that fights me as a caller. Maybe I start getting lost in the melody and start singing the melody instead of chanting hash. You can find that all out in about 30 or 60 seconds right in the record shop if you'll use those three steps for buying a hoedown. I've already talked about knowing your hoedown as well as your singing call, uh, where to set the needle back passages that you can make use of and things like that. So I'll pass over that right now. And I, I can emphasize, again, try to match the mood of your hoedown to the mood of what you're trying to do for that tip. If it's a workshop tip, pick a hoedown that stays in the background. If it's the kind of tip where you want to excite the crowd and really drive them nuts, then you've got music available to do that for you. Okay, we're getting really close to the time on the end here. I'd like to ask if there are any questions of any of the three of us, anything that you'd just like for us to comment on, anybody at all. Yes. <laughs> Come to me on hi hat was the first one that he used. Uh, for those of you that, that uh, teach classes, I have one little thing here. I, I had several demonstrations of the same kind of thing that Wade did, but I think he made such a beautiful point of it, I'm not going to add to it at all. I do have a couple of things that those of you that can use, that especially teach classes. Jack was talking earlier this, uh, this afternoon about teaching dancers to dance to the beat. And I don't know about you, but the first night of lessons, I have people doing singing calls. Very, very simple singing calls, but... To me, singing calls are the, the best way in the world to get new dancers to dance on the beat and on the phrase of the music. Now, I've only got two or three with me, but there are others that I'm sure that will come to mind when I demonstrate what I'm trying to say. There's a very pretty singing call on Red Boot called Wheels. It's old now. It's been out for a couple of years. But this is a tune that originally had no uh, lyrics at all. There was, it was uh, done way back in the 50s, and there was never any lyrics. They put some lyrics to it on the singing call, which I don't use. I just let them promenade to the music because the music is good and the lyrics are pretty, and everybody knows the old tune wheels. They'll probably be whistling along with you or humming along anyway. But it's a beautiful tune, especially to get beginners to dance to the phrase of the music. <laughs> Four ladies chain go. Four ladies chain. Oh, I wish you weren't on there. <laughs> it's not bad. All right, this uh, he brings out something that. Um, 
it, this is what I don't, for lack of a better word, I call it contra calling. Uh, because it's similar to the way we cue contras. I'm not a contra teacher or a contra caller. It's a technique that I've picked up from listening to other callers and probably from guys who have cued contras for years. But it's what I call pre-cueing basics. It's especially valuable when working for beginners because if you can pre-cue on the 6th, 7th, and 8th beat and let them start walking on beat 1 for the